Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Draft, where tonight we'll bring our season ticket members an exclusive behind-the-scenes look into this year's Rams draft. I'm the voice of your Rams, J.B. Long, and I want to thank you for joining us. We sure do miss seeing you in person, but we had such a great time previewing the draft, we thought we'd circle back for another get-together in this setting. In a moment, I'll be joined by General Manager Les Sneed, and he's going to give us a sense of his philosophy and process with respect to the draft. And then we'll find out how it all played out a couple weeks ago in a format that none of our guests this evening have ever experienced. So Les will be by my side for the next hour. And along the way, we'll bring in the area scouts that were responsible for so much of the research and talent evaluation that eventually led to the Rams selecting nine new players. All right, time to bring on the man who presides over everything draft-related for your Los Angeles Rams. He just completed his ninth draft with the organization. His first was back in 2012. Please welcome General Manager Les Sneed, and fingers crossed that uh, he is wearing his now signature eyewear for another uh, edition of an exclusive season ticket member event. Les, are you with us? I think I'm with you. Am I with you? Y'all tell me if I'm with us. There you are. Here. Indeed, you are wearing the glasses. It looks like uh, you're enjoying the confines of your home nearby the draft war room from a couple of weeks ago. Definitely got the enjoying the the natural Southern Cal, nice temperatures, you know, indoor outdoor living. Excellent. So nice to see you again. And having put some time and space between us and that 2020 draft weekend, what are your kind of major takeaways, reflections on what took place? I. Uh, I think the, the major takeaway, uh, successful for uh, us in terms of the strategy and vision that uh, we implemented, we derived, we thought about, we collaborated over in the months leading up to the draft. And, and, and we, we went into it and we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish uh, in particular with the 2020 draft. And there's, there's a lot of different uh, missions uh, that we went in. Uh, and uh, we were successful uh, in a lot of those missions. So Les, tell us about the group we're gonna hear from tonight. I don't think much of our audience has seen them or interacted with them necessarily. And namely, what makes a good scout and how do you organize and deploy them for the Rams? Good, I think, I, I think the uh, number one thing that makes a, a really good scout is they're, they're, you, there's probably a natural instinct, uh, intuition, adeptness at evaluating, uh, let's call it college football talent, being able to use probably years of experience. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be years. It could be just a lot of hours of tape and being able to project that talent uh, and how it's going to transcend and, and actually uh, thrive or not thrive at the NFL level. And then there's a, a, a very unsung element where uh, the area scout's very much like a detective and he's got a file, a case, a mystery to solve. And there is a definite uh, advantage when you have the ability to build uh, trustworthy relationships to be able to come away with the necessary data on the, on the human being on what makes that human being tick. And once we figure out what makes that particular human being uh, tick, does our environment with the Rams actually, uh, you know, help or hinder uh, what actually makes the, because the player tick because ultimately it's up to us and our coaching staff to to uh, help raise develop mold that player into, into going from college football player to professional so we'll hear from a lot of voices tonight and that made me think how do you handle disagreements during the draft process because with that many minds evaluating hundreds of prospects surely there are healthy differences in opinion either between you and a scout or a scout and a position coach how does that all get ironed out before the draft weekend and before the pick is made? The, it, ultimately, for me as the general manager, I, I like to call it dissent and not necessarily disagreement because uh, really we don't um, necessarily know who's right or who's wrong at the moment. That's to be determined, you know, one to two to three to four years from now. But <laughs> what I do like to do is I love dissent. I appreciate it. Uh, like to – basically make sure that I carve out enough time in April where my particular individual research is done and I can really listen in April to the dissent 
because uh, I always like to say, if one person has the courage to go against the grain, maybe we should listen to that person. That person might have the, the more important nugget uh, or point uh, that could, you know, definitely be the, the final and most, uh, you know, crucial piece of the puzzle. So uh, do your research, but definitely listen, take a lot of notes, try to put all the, all the thoughts together and, and, and see if you can solve the mystery. And the mystery is, hey, how can this particular player help or not help the Rams in our current environment? And that current environment has a, a lot of drawbacks. Unfortunately, we've covered those in previous sessions. But one thing we haven't talked a ton about yet that I think pertains to tonight's conversation is midway through this year's draft prep, Sean McVay hired three new coordinators. And on defense especially, I wonder how much change in terms of what Brandon Staley was now looking for and how that ultimately may have impacted your draft board. There's, there's definitely similarities of what we've done in the past. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be, let's call it, at a, at a simple, uh, uh, let's call it low-hanging fruit level, both are, are three, four systems, right? Where in base defense, there's maybe three defensive linemen four linebackers, but two of the outside linebackers somewhat act as defensive linemen. So, uh, but that's, 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 you know, that's the similarities, but with every defense, there's definitely uh, different nuances. And the, the positive uh, thing about the environment is before we were, you, before we had to split up, and even if we would have had to split up before this, we would have definitely done it. But we did sit with uh, Brandon. He went over with our, with our group about the differences, the nuances, and it did change our draft board uh, because what he was going to ask certain players to do, what they were to look like, uh, how they were to play, were going to be slightly different than what maybe Wade Phillips and his defense would have asked these players to do. Last thing for me, Les, before we bring in our first area scout, and that is so much ink was devoted to how this draft would be different because of how remote everyone was and that might lead to general managers and scouting departments just trusting the legwork they had put in for all the months and all the film study and maybe not getting sucked into some group think or group conversations that impacts us as human beings in any walk of life did you find that to be the case that you drafted more off of kind of the legwork you had put in or was it the same as every other year in that regard well we we uh uh, you'd like to think it's the same, but it's probably not. We do, we do try to stress that uh, we're looking for, uh, you know, players to play football on Sundays on a football field. And, and most of the answers to our test will be uh, going back and watching those players play football on a football field on Saturdays. And, uh, you know, I like to – I always say it's like uh, if, you're, if you're looking probably for a, a really good guitar player, right, uh, the probably the best thing to do is 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 go to maybe Nashville somewhere and 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 sit back and listen to that player play the guitar. But you, if you were to go and 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 maybe uh, segment it and watch him practice or listen to him in the garage, it, it may give you some insight, but it could lead you uh, down a wrong path. So uh, we always like, hey, just go watch the musician play the guitar, and 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 if it sounds good, that's usually how it's going to be in the NFL. Did we ever get a hand size measurement on Eric Clapton or know if that impacts guitar playing, by the way? I'm sure if those, uh, I'm sure if we went and we got a musician on here or, or what have <laughs> you, they have their, their nuances, their, their pro days, their combines, their measurements, you know, and that's what we bring in our, our analytics department to do to try to tell us, you know, at this particular position, uh, the vertical jump means more than maybe, you know, the short shuttle or at this particular position, the hand size. Uh, maybe means more. So, uh, you know, whether that's drummers or guitar players. Well, well this is an honor for me to be uh, hanging with you tonight. And I'm curious to see uh, how much you enjoy a co-hosting role. So don't be shy about diving in with follow-up questions to your area scouts as we introduce them to our audience. Okay. Yeah. My, my wife would probably tell you I would be a, a an awful co-host. Probably, <laughs> probably best to stick to my day job, but no, I do, I uh, I'll try to help. Cause I know these guys uh, put in a lot of time, uh, and, and we'll try to make it fun. And, and, and the goals to, for our season ticket holders to, uh, for, these, for this group to give them an experience that they don't necessarily get to read about or, or maybe uh, experience themselves. Exactly right. So with that as our starting point, let's dig into the selections the Rams made during the 2020 draft and bring in the scout responsible for vetting the 52nd overall pick. 
couple of weekends ago, Florida State running back Cam Akers. And so we say good evening to the Rams' Eastern Area Scout, Michael Pierce. Now, some of you undoubtedly watched the Inside the Draft piece the Rams just circulated a couple of days ago, where Les poses this hypothetical directly to Michael. And he says, Akers in the second, or the Michael P. Ryan, uh, a UF back, in the fourth. And funny how things kind of played out on actual draft days with that exact hypothetical. So, Michael, why was that such an easy answer for you in favor of Cam Akers, I wonder? Well, my biggest question was, was he going to be there for us at that pick? So, no, I'm excited. I, I always thought he would have been a great back for us. So that, that, was, that was awesome. I'm glad we got a chance to get him. You know, it's interesting. He was the only Seminole drafted this year, and I've heard a lot in recent days about how Akers was able to stay positive despite playing in a tough era of Florida State football and despite playing behind, you know, an offensive line that may not have been adequate or up to their standard. How did you factor in those intangibles to your evaluation? No, that was a, that was a huge part of it. I think that was that was the most fun part of evaluating him because you see a guy that like you said, there hasn't been a lot of draft picks. In the last three years, there's four draft picks out of Florida State. He's one of them, and there's only one other offensive lineman drafted out of there. Hmm. He's there for three years, and, and this is not the Florida State of the past where, you know, they, they were pumping out a lot of guys. But you saw one constant throughout his three years there. You saw a guy that worked hard. He had a Warriors mentality, and this guy was like – this, this was a breath of fresh air with, with all the turmoil that was there. You saw, hey, these, these teams came in to Florida State and they were going to stop him. But he was always productive and he was always, always, always the guy that was positive. You never saw in the evaluation process, you want to see, hey, does this guy ever get bothered by this? He never, get, not, never got bothered by it. He was always steadfast. He was a guy that was always pumping his guys up. He always wanted the ball and, and kind of never slowed down. So that, that was the cool part, that the warrior mentality with him. The, the talent speaks for itself. I mean, this is, this is a complete back, like I said on, the, on that show. It was like, this is, this is a complete back that can do everything. But then you see the war, warrior mentality. And in the, age of, in the age of, hey, let's go to the transfer portal, he never – he never flinched, stayed the course. And that's the type of guy you want, the loyalty, the guy that's going to be a warrior no matter what. Yeah, we know Sean loves those Rams who uh, never flinch when adversity strikes. But he does ask a lot of his running backs. And the one the Rams are trying to replace did it on all three downs, as you know, in the passing game and pass protection. How confident are you in Cam's ability to absorb his assignments, complicated though they may be, and execute them as a rookie on game day? Absolutely. I'm confident in him. I think, he, like I said, he, he's, the, he's the total package. You see him run the ball. You see him be patient. You see him be explosive. You see him do all of those things. And you also see him catch the ball out of the backfield. You see one hand that catches two years ago against, against Florida, and you're like, man, this, this guy can really do it all. And that, that's what you saw. You saw, hey, this is the workhorse. Every team stacked the box against him. Guess what he says? Give me the ball. Let me go run, and I'm going to still be productive. So I think that mentality still is going to carry over. Now, Michael, how many lines down your report did you mention the fact that he can sling it too? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't get into that. But, I mean, that, that was a fun part of watching him and seeing, hey, this is a high school quarterback. Hey, and if, line him up at quarterback, and now he has a threat to run it, and he can throw it. So, no, that was cool too. You well, know what, I was going to say, JB, on that, uh, Michael made about three points. I'll try to hit him quickly, right? On the sling in it now, I, I do know my wife has a video one night of uh, Sean had sent a, a text to kind of a group responsible for looking at the running backs and basically he, he had one of these shots and he was, he was in, uh, let's call it ESPN mode, uh, articulating, you know, the design of the play and how rare it was for, you know, maybe a, a running back to roll left and then, you know, twist and turn and then throw the ball right-handed 70-something, drop a dime. Uh, it's in, you know, and, and Michael, when, when he went over the player, he, we all mentioned the tough sledding that it has been at Florida State, especially on the offensive side of the ball last three years, it, compared to what they've been in the past. And very tough conference. Uh, and like Michael said, teams went in to stop Cam. And, and the way we blend a little bit of our, our analytics department is, okay, let's do a study on, on – uh, let's call it like this, Cam averaged five yards a carry in a very tough conference. 
Uh, some other backs in the draft averaged six or more, but Cam on average was getting uh, his first contact, the first time a defender was, was basically touching, trying to bring Cam down was about 1.15 yards down the field, where a lot of the other backs, when you, when you blend up all the math, are getting hit for the first time, you know, somewhere two and a half to three yards down the field. There's just more space to run. So there's some data to back it up as you, as you watch this, as Michael said, warrior run the football. Well, Michael, great to see you and to hear from you. Uh, congratulations on uh, all the legwork that you put in that went into the first uh, Rams selected in the 2020 NFL draft. All right. Thanks, JB. All right. Have a good rest of your night. All right. And we're going to stay in the second round because just five picks later, at number 57, as you know, the Rams selected Van Jefferson out of Florida. First wide receiver drafted by the Rams in the first two rounds since Tavon back in 2013. And to help provide some background on the pick, we welcome in the Rams Director of Scouting Strategy, James Gladstone. And James, I love this pick because it's a great study in drafting according to need or value, the, the eternal debate that rages. And after the Brandon Cooks trade, I think you could say, yeah, there was a need in the Rams receiving core, right? But on the other hand, you had Woods, Cup, Reynolds, and the Rams started using fewer three receiver sets by the end of last year. So how did you balance those dynamics when evaluating what many thought was a historically great receiver class? Yeah, you know, following the Brandon Cooks trade, uh, that was when we ultimately turned our attention to the depth of the wide group receiver position within the draft and uh, though Van Jefferson was not the first wide receiver that we discussed for this group of, of uh, you know draft prospects it quickly became apparent that that he would be the first wide receiver that we would consider drafting and the primary reason for that uh, ultimately stemmed from uh, you know his his vicious route running that could leave even even the best defensive backs in college football grasping for cloth and and ultimately, the leverage and nuance that that Van plays with is something that that will make him a tough matchup as as defensive backs essentially attempt to cancel him out of the equation. But you know, since we're speaking with with a Rams fan base, and to help paint a clearer picture, I think as you consider uh, Robert Woods and Cooper Cup, and if they were standing side by side with each other, and they were looking into a mirror. Uh, their reflection would be that of Van Jefferson. Wow, I love that. That's really cool. You know, you talk about, you know, trusting the high-level competition that he thrived against as a result of that route running. One game in particular stands out when he goes for 873 and two touchdowns against LSU, arguably the best secondary in the country and eventual national champions. How reassuring is a performance like that to validate what you think about an NFL projection? Yeah, if there's, if there's any need for any more proof of the value that Van's going to bring to the Rams, you can simply turn to that game, which is against the would-be national champion, LSU Tigers. And, and also what he does there is showcase, showcases a, a plethora of, of traits that will leave any viewer excited about his skill set. Ultimately, he's going up against uh, a group of defensive backs that, that you can argue is the best uh, across the country and drawing from – really a few plays, two of which that take place inside the 10 yard line as they're threatening to score, but matched up against an underclassman who will eventually be a top 10 pick at cornerback. Uh, he ends up doing a great job having the cushion off the line of scrimmage, pressing the defensive back, creating leverage to create this legitimate separation off of a snap down with a strong finish outside the frame to extend for a touchdown between two defenders. Then you move into even later in the game, uh, where there's another matchup inside the 10. This time it's it's clearly a one-on-one -on -one situation where his draw off the line of scrimmage to sell what would be an end zone fade, flipping the hips of the defender while giving a crossover uh, for a beautifully timed uh, touchdown uh, was something that was was the epitome of artwork on the field. And then following an offensive drive by by LSU that resulted in a touchdown the first play off the kickoff, He's matched up with that same defensive back on the, the minus 25, does a playful dance off the line of scrimmage, scrimmage to free up some space, uh, challenges downfield and threatens and then throttles for a back shoulder completion. Just ultimately making, uh, making what would be for every single receiver uh, a very challenging game look very easy and simple. James, have you ever considered play-by-play? 
as a fallback career? <laughs> you know what? Have not have not even considered it by any means. I know that at this point in time, with this phase of life, uh, stay rooted in the moment. Focus my attention on on really this crop of of wide receivers in the draft, and uh, ultimately looking forward to what will be next year's crop. Well, hey, JB, are- JB, just a humble James. Back when he was, uh, I got to know James when he was an offensive coordinator, high school football. And I do know this, there were some parents in the stands who disagreed with James and play call. You know, one of the mom's son was a running back, and James kept, you know, like most of these offensive coordinators these days, airing it out. But she was, you know, more than whispering. Hey, uh, JB. Probably she just oh. run the football. Ball. Don't let Les fool you. It wasn't just the other parents. He was he was given a few shots there every now and then. Well, that's a great transition to parents and pedigree because NFL pedigree is a theme that's going to bubble up a couple times in this draft conversation. And Les, I understand you have a connection with Sean Jefferson from his time in Atlanta. So maybe we go there next. How much or how little does something like that move the needle for a player like Van or a couple of the others that you ended up selecting in 2020? First of all, the very uh, neat phone call after we drafted Van to be able to talk with, with dad, Sean, who, uh, you know, I was, a, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, in Atlanta when he was, he was with the New England Patriots to start his career and we brought him in as an unrestricted free agent when I was a Falcon. So, but what was neat about that call is, is somewhat emotional because you, you, you knew Sean when he was a player and now we've, we've all seen him coach. If, if you go to the senior bowl and he's coaching, you know Sean Jefferson's on the field because he he coaches them old school now. It's not it's not new school coaching. It's it's in your face. Get better coaching. Uh, but what I realized was, holy cow! Based on the uh, situation we're in, Sean was actually not in a war room somewhere uh, in New York. He's now coaching with the Jets, but he was actually in the living room with Van and 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 didn't not really notice that till uh, looking on television, going, holy cow! Sean Sean's actually getting to spend this night with son which uh, like a lot of us in football, we don't, we miss a lot of those moments uh, with some, but on the pedigree part, the neat thing is, is when you can, as uh, James did a great job articulating, when you can see a former wide receiver who now is a wide receiver coach who Calvin Johnson has said is the best wide receiver coach he's ever played for. When you actually see uh, maybe what was taught at the dinner table being displayed on a field against some really good players against LSU, that's when you go, okay, uh, the, the pedigree has definitely, uh, I guess, uh, bled into son. But, uh, but to humble Sean, we're going to give uh, mom credit because uh, I don't know if Sean could run a route like his son Van. So uh, mom has something to do with that somewhere along the way in this, in this deal. Last thing on Van, because I think it might be um, a good illustration of how you allocated your resources differently this spring with respect to the combine and some other uh, senior events. And that is the foot injury, right? And as a result, you don't get a 40 time from Van at the combine. But I understand you did have some data from the Senior Bowl, an event you uh, referenced there that you trusted trusted to validate his foot foot speed that you saw on tape. Yeah, James, I'll let you, uh, you brought that data to the table. Uh, and we call it the we call it the Cooper Cup test, and and I'll lead in by Cooper Cup didn't run uh, let's call it an admirable forty yard dash mm-hmm. at the combine, but uh, in football pads and a football helmet running routes on a football field mobile, I'll let James finish. Yeah, I'm so probably not as good a host, but or play by play, JB. But here you go, James. So that was something, and to go back to even going up against quality competition, the Senior Bowl, as it relates to the scouting process, allows for a great uh, exposure into these players going up up against like uh, talent in a a different setting than what would be just their regular season. And you get to get a close-up view of that. So speaking back to 2017, when Cooper Cup uh, was, was high on our radar based off of uh, some of the things that he, he did in the prior prior summer, some of the things that he obviously did throughout his career at Eastern Washington, but then also his performance at the Senior Bowl itself. And uh, now, as it relates to some of the, the tools in the arsenal of scouting, you have GPS tracking that uh, these all-star games provide using what's called zebra technology. 
and uh, Cooper Cup in 2017 uh, stacked as the the fastest max speed for any player at the Senior Bowl, regardless of position. Fast forward to uh, the Senior Bowl in 2020, and Van Jefferson went ahead and did the same exact thing as Cooper Cup, producing the fastest max speed at 21 and a half miles per hour. So that was something that was a great tell uh, for us, even though we didn't have the opportunity to, let's say, uh, get a 40 on Van because of a foot injury, though that 40 uh, is not football speed. It does not have an enemy across from him. Those do sometimes act as a good way to compare uh, players to, to player at a similar position. Also something worth noting, and, and if you look at Van's statistics over the course of his career, they're not something that, that stand out as holy cow like Cooper Cups did. But as you track back to 2016, when he was at, uh, at Ole Miss, he was on the same receiving group and in the same recruiting class as A.J. Brown, who is currently playing for the Tennessee Titans, as well as D.K. Metcalf, who is currently playing for the Seattle Seahawks, both of which were rookies last year, both of which produced over 900 yards and nine and 10 touchdowns, respectively. Van Jefferson outproduced both of those players while serving on the same roster in 2016 at Ole Miss. So that gives you some comparable, uh, let's call it statistical measurement, even though Van's statistics won't jump out when you do go and look at them. Love that detail, James. And uh, in the comments section, our audience is demanding more face time for you. So if it's all right, come back a bit later to take us through the college free agent scramble, will you? No doubt, that'll be a fun talk. That's why yeah. I had to humble him, JB. I, I know. Yeah. You knew the comments were coming. We're going to knock them down. I'll build them back up. We're going to run the ball more. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about that huge class, 20-plus players who will be competing for an opportunity to make the Rams roster despite not being drafted. But next we shift to the defensive side of the ball for the first time tonight. And in the third round, the Rams selected outside linebacker Terrell Lewis out of Alabama with the 84th overall pick to talk tonight about what the Rams saw in him and why they think he can be a playmaker on the edge. We bring in area scout, Billy Johnson and Billy, this first question isn't uh, specific to Lewis necessarily, but I'm always curious, what's it like scouting Alabama players and how much weight does Nick Saban's insight about them carry in your discussions and evaluations? Oh, definitely. Um, I heard it from a great scout that Alabama's the Mecca. You know, scouts go out there. You, it's the land of the five stars, and you can go out there as a scout and just start drooling. Everybody looks good. And uh, you definitely listen. If he says something, you're going you're gonna to write it down and uh, probably put it in the report. That's for sure. I know the report listed uh, incredible explosiveness, and he sure does seem to have all the measurables. To bring this home to Los Angeles, is it true he has a LeBron James-like wingspan? He has the exact same. So this is a, uh, a guy that, you know, if any of the season ticket holders play Madden or their kids, you know, this is a Madden creative player. You're, you know, you're going to max out the height, max out the weight, max out the speed, and uh, it's going to look like Terrell Lewis. Probably the guy that you need to get off the bus first and uh, <laughs> really stands out. You know, they nicknamed him uh, down at Alabama uh, the Avatar, you know, in reference to the James Cameron movie, just how big and large those, you know, creatures were. Interesting. Did you see his Mike Tyson impersonation along the way, getting to know him? I heard it's a good one. I have not, no, but he's a uh, <laughs> awesome kid and a fun individual, so I need to look at it. Yeah, Billy, this is a position that new defensive coordinator Brandon Staley specialized in, right? Coming up as an NFL coach, outside linebackers under Vic Fangio in Chicago, and then Denver before Sean McVay brought him to Los Angeles. How well would you say Lewis matches what Brandon hopes for? Yeah, I think, you know, a guy that we signed this year in Leonard Floyd, I think um, just looking at the body type and the player, they, you know, very comfortable. And um, obviously they'll pair well with each other. And both of them are long and both of them fast. And we can see both of them, you know, getting after the quarterback. Let's jump in here. What are your recollections of that first report you had on, on Terrell and ultimately – deciding that you were willing to, you know, trust that some of the injury history was behind him and he would make a good pro? We, I think uh, if the, if, I wish I could show the audience a report and the, the detail that goes into uh, writing about and all the data that we have on, on these players. And it could be upwards uh, probably reading 
you know, a lot of words. I don't know how many, maybe 10, I don't, I don't even know the number to put on it, but there's definitely, you know, 10 pages of, of detailed notes uh, that you could probably go through on these players, but uh, somewhere buried in there, speaking of uh, Nick Saban, his staff, uh, as Billy said, the, the Mecca of five stars, uh, I do know there was one sentence written, not maybe, maybe by Billy, maybe by Ted Monago, uh, one of our other uh, front office execs who, uh, who cross checks Alabama, but somewhere in all of that data, there was a sentence that said, uh, after spring training, so this is the spring training after after Tua throws the walk off walk off touchdown to win the game, and amongst all those five stars and all the draftees they've had over the last few years, there was one sentence where either Billy or Ted wrote that the staff ranked uh, the Alabama players one through one twenty five or however many they have out there on that practice field. They ranked uh, Terrell one and two a second. So this is coming out. So. I remember uh, at nauseum of, of, of really trying to figure out this player and, and work through him. That, that sentence and uh, that piece of data definitely resonated that uh, a, a very astute staff that's won a lot of games, uh, has seen a lot of talent, uh, definitely uh, put this five-star as their most talented player on the team. He's now going to walk into a situation where the outside linebacker room is a little bit crowded, but not necessarily as proven as it has been at various times during the Rams' history. How do you think he's prepared, you know, Billy, to compete now? I mean, he, he comes in as a highly touted recruit. He plays for Alabama. He's the cream of the crop. And now he goes into a situation where we're kind of in, you know, uncertain waters here, and he's going to have to make an impression early and often. I don't think he's scared of competition. You know, he's done it um, down there at Alabama for his whole career and had to compete and hold off guys. And so coming in here, there'll be nothing new. He's going to compete. And, um, you know, he's going to have to prove himself and, and get better. But we, you know, hope that he can – get to the ceiling that he, you know, where he can contribute for us. That's great to hear, Billy. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you for the insight. Yeah, thank you. All right, from Terrell Lewis to Terrell Burgess with the 104th overall pick, one of those compensatory selections at the end of the third round. The Rams selected the Utah safety after his standout season. He played his college ball in Salt Lake but has Southern California roots. And to talk more about Burgess, we bring in the West Coast Area Scout for the Rams, Vito Ganella. Good evening, Vito. How are you? Very well. How are you doing, JB? Doing great. You know, I think most draft Knicks regard Burgess as the Rams' pick of the draft in 2020. Is that a good feeling, or does that leave you feeling a, a bit uneasy? No, that's a, that's a good – you know, this guy was my sleeper going in. This time last year in the summer tapes when I first uh, evaluated him, and going into it, I knew he was going to be a guy that uh, other teams and scouts wouldn't know about because his junior year, he wasn't necessarily a starter. He played a lot, but he played behind Marquise Blair, who was a second-round pick to the Seattle Seahawks the year before. So going into it, I knew he was going to be a guy that was just going to be my sleeper, my best-kept secret. Well, that, that secret didn't last too long because once the season kicked off uh, – <laughs> Oh, he couldn't hide the talent. He was making interceptions and breaking up passes and making tackles all over the field. And what really put the icing on the cake for him to get spotted by scouts and uh, teams was when they faced off against uh, USC in the Coliseum. And I know there's a lot of Trojan fans on this video conference, so fight on. But, and they won that game. But uh, Terrell Burgess had a key interception in that game in the fourth quarter to keep Utah hanging around. And the biggest thing about that interception is how he positioned himself to play multiple receivers in zone coverage was just unbelievable. And after that game right there, his, his stock just skyrocketed and was a senior bowl invite and went to the combine. And thank God we were fortunate enough to still draft him uh, where we did because I'm absolutely thrilled to have him on our team now. Yeah, less what Vito mentions there about his position flexibility. I know there were some questions about whether he projects as a nickel or a safety first with the Rams or maybe both. Uh, was that an instance of exactly what we're talking about in terms of his ability, uh, ability to break in at a few different oh, spots? Certainly, I think that was – I know you, we, we, we brought up the new defense coordinator, Brandon Staley, and I think uh, one of these – type players that uh, is a jack of all trades that is very versatile that you can uh, put in your defensive backfield and and either play let's call it traditionally like the the old school free safety on the back end uh, or could even go up and 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 move from safety and and cover 
uh, the team's, uh, you know, better slot uh, receiver. So that definitely makes him a versatile weapon. It's something that uh, Brandon really uh, emphasizes. Like, like Terrell, he loves his defensive lineman to be long. He would like to have a lot of LeBron James-like wingspans. Not sure there's that many on the planet, but he loved that that front five, the three defensive linemen, uh, the – the two outside backers to, to, to be long. And he, he loves defensive backs and he loves versatile defensive backs. And he definitely felt that uh, Terrell was one of those guys that would, uh, you know, add that versatility. Vito, last one for me here. Utah has become, you know, the DBU of the West, if you will. And for that reason, Burgess had to wait his turn, right, on the depth chart. So I wonder, like, what's your level of trust and what Kyle Whittingham and Morgan Scally have established in terms of that NFL pipeline when making a recommendation like this to, I guess, in a sense, replace Eric Weddle, another great you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, they really tell you on tape what they feel about him because Terrell played post safety, box safety, nickel, and then also dime linebacker all in one game. So... So they're telling you what they feel about his mental capacity to play all those positions in one game and how smart he is. And then, of course, talking to those guys, as soon as you bring up Terrell Burgess, just a big smile goes up on their faces, and they just said, this kid does everything right. He's just so smart, smart as a whip. So, uh, you know, very versatile decent, uh, safety, and I'm really looking forward to watching them play in a Rams uniform. I may be back, JB. I'm back. Did, uh, did Jeff Graves – just hook you up. You know what? Other, uh... We're going to give the ghost to Jeff Graves credit. But uh, I'll finish my story. It doesn't matter when, like, uh, like Vito, it doesn't matter when you first find your sleeper because the draft is uh, in the future. Uh, like the Cooper Cup scenario, this guy goes to the senior bowl. He goes to the combine runs of 4-4. And, and a week before the 2017 draft, I used to text Steve Smith all the time as he was screaming – from the top of his lungs that Cooper Cup was the best route runner in the draft. So it doesn't matter, Vito, when you find your sleeper. If they're good, they're going to be discovered before the draft. Uh, Les told me that in December meetings when I was uh, presenting on him that uh, there's no such thing as, much, as a like, real sleeper in the NFL. Everyone's going to discover these guys. And that just brought me back to my college days when I was working in college football, finding recruits and kids in high school football when there really was those sleepers that no one offered and you can grab them and land them and then all of a sudden watch them flourish on a college roster. But, yes, now working in the NFL, I agree with you, Les. You're right. There are no sleepers. Uh, it's so cool that there was a moment in Los Angeles at the Coliseum that really solidified his, his NFL future in your eyes and can't wait to see him make an impact at SoFi Stadium next. We appreciate you, Vito. Thank you. Have a good day. All right, Les and I will switch back to the offensive side now. We're on Saturday, day three of the draft. In the fourth round, the Rams grab Purdue tight end Bryson Hopkins with the 136 overall pick. For more on the Big Ten tight end of the year, we are joined by Assistant Director of College Scouting, Ted Monago. Teddy, it's great to see you and to hear from you. How are things? Oh, JB, it's great to see you and hear from you. You know, there's many days driving down the road on Rams or Sirius Satellite Radio listening to the Rams game in your voice just taking us down the highway that's the only way I just remember that uh game in London and you were uh, uh broadcasting on the, on the Pennsylvania Turnpike and you said the Bengals haven't found a way to stop Cooper Cup on third down I just had a vision of you know you get to watch the game take the next day and just having that vision of Cooper being open and you know you hang on every play with the steering wheel so it's nice to what you do, which is it, 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 for us scouts on the road, if we can't catch the game on TV to hear you on uh, satellite radio is just amazing. Well, this is your opportunity to shine. So we're glad uh, our audience gets shine. to meet you and learn a little bit more about your work. And, you know, Teddy, here's another example of NFL pedigree, right? His dad, Brad, yeah. played, you know, more than a dozen years as a great offensive lineman. Did you see the son of a pro when you watched him at Purdue? Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, you, when, you, when you first go in and look at a player, you, you want to read a little bit about him, and that starts the way we – how Les sets up our process, what the scouts are doing. Uh, we start looking at the draft-eligible players um, once they're eligible in the summertime, and 
you know, you do a little research, you got a little time to read about him. And he's obviously, his dad, Brad Hopkins, was a first round draft pick in 1993 out of the University of Illinois and played a long time for the Houston slash Tennessee Titans. And actually, I believe his dad played in the Super Bowl against the Rams. So that does come into a factor. And of course, you know, what's been mentioned earlier with our man Jefferson and his father. So that's two um, father-son combinations in our draft class, which makes it a little bit unique. Um, but it does come in. I'm a, I'm a sucker for that. I, I, I really am. I, I think that's important because they grow up around the game and you either, you know, the kids are either going to be in it or they're not. And, uh, you know, um, Bryson decided to start playing football his junior year in high school. So he's got a lot of upside. Well, I definitely want to get your thoughts on this topic and Les's as well, because the knock that everyone seemed to go to right away was drops, college right. drops. And I had a good conversation with Bryson about this already and how sick he is of, of hearing that reputation and how much he can't wait to dispel it. But how much of a concern, if any, did that present you when evaluating how he might impact an NFL game? You know, it's interesting. Um, it's kind of like sometimes with missed tackles for defensive players. I mean, obviously, if, there's, if the, you don't like him missing tackles, but he's around the play, he's being targeted. Obviously, that's clutch. With his drops, it went from four to seven. But his targets went from basically 54 in 2018 to 91 in 2019. And his receptions went up from 35 to 62. So, yes, he had seven drops. Uh, and total, total, 21 total career drops, but he was heavily targeted in that system. And, um, you know, in some of those targets, some of those catches, obviously got to come up and, and get stronger hands, but it's something that, you know, he's going to work on. And we tend to nitpick those things as scouts. Those, it's kind of like the pitcher that can't paint the corner, you know, mm -hmm. and get that batter out. So we, we want to nitpick. But I will say this, what he, what he was for me, was a reliable player. We grade him in the run pass game. He was very reliable on first down and he had 40 first down completions. So that means there, you know, if you got to get a third and five or third and seven or third and two, and he's in that option primary route or he, they're working him to get open, he's moving the chains. You know, less need doesn't always mean for this coming season. And yes, the Rams have a really nice tight end group here for 2020, but only one of them, I understand, Tyler Higby is under contract beyond the season. So is this an example of what you talk about with the telescope perspective rather than the microscope in terms of planning for the future of the tight end room? Well, from, from a microscope uh, perspective, we definitely want to get the, the tight ends and maybe uh, – let's call it more elaborate, elaborate personnel packages uh, implemented for that's the 2020, that's the microscopic uh, thought there. Telescope, you know, the telescope, you know, looking at it from a telescope or a lens of telescope, the long term is just as you said, uh, with Gerald Everett not under, this being his last year under contract, uh, it does, it gives an element of, of fail safe if, 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 if Gerald were to move on or what have you. So uh, that's what you have to do in the, the front office. It's also, this was also one of those moves uh, in the draft because of what you said, uh, tight end being a luxury. Uh, but uh, he was definitely, I mean, Bryson was definitely one of the better players on the board at that particular time. But when we looked up, we really didn't necessarily have to have a tight end. We actually liked him. Uh, he was our tight end coach's, you know, Wes Phillips' number one player. Uh, so what we did is that that's the, I think the Houston Texans knocked on our door and, and asked us to move back ten spots, and, and we were able to collect uh, two more seventh rounders uh, to move back. And and a lot of times you go, okay, look, we're we're at a luxury spot right here. We like a player that we would draft. We don't have to have him. Let's take the two extra seventh rounders that might enable us to draft the kicker and some other guys later in the draft, move back 10 spots. We still like where the board is. Uh, if someone takes Bryson, because it is a somewhat luxury position for 2020, although I do think w this, this uh, Bryson's gonna catch some balls for us. Uh, we were able to move back, collect two picks and, and let the draft fall to us. And, and fortunately, Bryson was still there and uh, we took him in. And on the drops, uh, Teddy did a nice job talking about targets and things like that. A lot of times there's an old, old adage, adage in scouting, uh, 
when you're the when you're the top targeted uh, receiver weapon on your team, that means the uh, offensive coordinator and more importantly, the quarterback who really doesn't want to look bad on Saturday afternoons is going. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get the ball uh, to Mr. Hopkins and, and get the ball to him on third downs and move the chain. So uh, sometimes you let the quarterback tell you. If great guy point. Catch well, Teddy, I tell the folks at Purdue, thanks for sending us a couple of great Boilermakers, sure. not only Bryson, but Justin Levitt, the new strength coach as well. Certainly. And, you know, just to add to this point, it, we, the other connection with um, Bryson is, of course, with Tyler Higby and Coach Brom, because Coach Brom coached Tyler at, at Western uh, Kentucky. So there was definitely a familiarity, and Bryson spent a lot of time this past offseason, heading into the 2019 season, studying Tyler. Their position coach was working with him. So the familiarity really was an added plus for the Rams, and I hope that, you know, it comes to fruition on the field and he has a great career. So I'm really excited. Teddy, you and me a deep dish in Chicago sometime soon, I hope, okay? Well, let's, let's hope so. It's a winter day and we go and beat them. So that's all. They're coming to us this year. So make, we're going to get – well, I'm like, we'll, we'll be good. Looking forward to the game. <laughs> Only season ticket members Both here. Good member. company. Material. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right, appreciate that TED Talk, as our man Joy Hirsch coined it, on Bryson Hopkins. Thanks for spending time with us and have a great rest of your night, Teddy. Thank you. God bless we'll you go guys. to uh, the Rams' sixth-round pick. 199 overall, also out of Big Ten country. Ohio State and safety Jordan Fuller next for more on the two-time Buckeye captain, an academic All-American, and the nephew of comedian and actor Sinbad. We bring in Midwest area scout Brian Hill. Good evening, Brian. Hey, Jamie. How's it going? It's going great. And uh, as I understand the chronology, Jordan replaced Malik Hooker, a first-round draft pick in the Buckeye secondary as a sophomore. So he was, you know, a starter for most of his career. And there must have been a ton of high-level game tape to evaluate on him what stood out. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he was a three-time starter, two-time captain, and an elite program, um, you know, during the college football playoffs every year. And, uh, you know, he started off as a corner in high school, played some nickel at Ohio State. And this year uh, they play um, straight up press man coverage on the outside. So he's the only lone safety. So he gets a ton of action, and he's got to be the safety net back there. And there must have been some reason he's still available at 199 coming out of a program like that and with his credentials. What gave teams pause? And is this one of those picks where you're banking on the fact that, hey, a Buckeye who's all Big Ten will find a way to overcome any shortcomings in the NFL? Yeah, I think we got a steal. I think um, he had a previous hip injury the year before, and this year he was finally healthy. They didn't hold him back at all in practice. He was ready to go on Saturdays. Uh, I think a slow 40 time at Indy got him, but he plays faster than that. I mean, he's got range. You know, our coaches talk about, you know, one chance to find the angle at safety, and he does that. He plays with excellent angles, and he makes up ground quick. All right, now, Les, is your time with the Sinbad story. I know you got a good one for us. Well, the, the, the interesting thing before I go to, to Sinbad, and can't wait to, to meet him just as I couldn't wait to meet Dale Murphy when we had Dale Murphy's son a couple of year, years ago as a CFA. But if you, if you get to know Brian Hill, he's, he's no nonsense. Uh, he has no problem uh, dissenting, uh, uh, even if you try to talk him into maybe liking a player that doesn't meet his standards. But won't get in any particulars, but uh, uh, our uh, Jake Timmy, who works in our analytics department, noticed something with the particular grade that Brian Hill gave Jordan Fuller. And this code that we kind of stamp on the grade, which means, hey, really want this human being uh, in the Rams locker room. It's kind of a scout's way to, you know, when they're on the road, when they're like Teddy and they're, they're driving to their next school, listening to you, and they see that and they kind of find that player and vet that player and they stamp it. And, uh, but uh, won't get into it, but there's only, there's only about five players, maybe seven, that Ron Hill's ever given this grade to, and, and all of them are uh, very successful in the NFL. So that, that grade meant something to him. Uh, but, uh, the, oh, the Sinbad story would be long time ago. I was at Auburn, a student at Auburn, and, and uh, Tuskegee, uh, the town of Tuskegee, the college of Tuskegee is probably maybe 30 miles away from Auburn. And, and at that point in time, it's, it's early 90s, and, and Sinbad's the uh, – I mean, he's the big deal then now. But I, I do remember uh, – bunch of us football players jumping in the 
in the in the cars and and hightailed it down to Tuskegee and, and packed in the very historic university and auditorium there to to hear. It might have been my first ever seeing a a comedian uh, live. So we'll always remember Sinbad. So when I found out Sinbad was an uncle, you know, I'll be sure to nudge up to Jordan sometime soon and see if we can invite him to a game. Mother was a backup singer for Whitney Houston and Bruce Springsteen too. So maybe a good candidate for a national anthem at SoFi Stadium some Sunday afternoon. Yeah, the, after we, I mean, that's what we, we talked about all of this mom and, and, and brother was at UCLA and uncle Sinbad. You finally ask, Hey, uh, can the guy play football? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's good to have Brian on the case. And, uh, hey, in 2021, we wish you good luck finding another one of those stamps, okay? Thanks, Chad, Dean. Appreciate it. Nice to see you tonight. You too. And our next guest had the uh, pleasure of scouting not only a great college football player, but probably one of the best personalities in the entire draft. After speaking to him on the phone, after the Rams made the pick, you might have heard the story of how head coach Sean McVay said, quote, I have never experienced a call like that in my life. I was starting to fade a little bit in the seventh round, and this guy gave me a shot of adrenaline, but I felt like I was going to put my head through a wall. So to get more on the dynamic personality of Baylor linebacker Clay Johnson, we welcome in Rams senior personnel advisor Taylor Morton. Hey, Taylor, uh, you ever tempted to run through a wall while getting to know Clay? What's up, JB? How you doing, JB? It's good to see you. I like that shirt. Maybe you can puff it up a little bit for our audience yeah, there. Like Nicely that, huh? warm. Yeah. Just got indeed. in the mail the other day. Awesome. Tell us about Clay. You know, Clay Johnson is going to bring a lot of energy uh, to our football team. I'm sure a lot of you saw it on, on social media when, when Coach McVay made that call to him. He just went ballistic in his, in his living room with his whole family, and it was so cool to see. But that, that's the kind of passion that he plays with on the field. Uh, he's a high energy guy. He he's really tough. Plays with a lot of grit. Flies around, and uh, just was a really good middle linebacker for Baylor this year. Now, when you're evaluating a seventh round prospect, ultimately like this, are you naturally projecting how he'll perform as a core special teamer as well, knowing that's how he's going to have to break in? Yeah, and and he did that. He did that throughout his career at Baylor and had success doing that. And you know, even though we got him in the seventh round. You got to remember, he had a torn ACL uh, in his knee uh, after the sixth game of the season. So we really projected that he was going to be a higher pick mm -hmm. than what we got. So I think he's going to be a steal of a deal in the seventh round because we'll rehab him and get him healthy. And, uh, you know, I, I think he's going to have a really good chance of making our team. Connect the dots for us, if you will, with his father, a longtime NFL strength coach, and then also Brett Favre. Yeah, yeah, his dad's been a strength coach for over 25 years in the NFL. So he grew up around the game. He's got it in his blood. Um, at some point, his dad was at Green Bay with, with Brett Favre. And so he kind of latched on to Brett, and, uh, and Brett was a big influence in his life. So at Baylor, his senior year, uh, it's a tr tradition where uh, they select a handful of guys who are like the hardest workers on the team and let them wear a single-digit number. So uh, he – obviously picked number four when it was his turn to pick and, uh, and did that just in, in terms of uh, relating with, with Brett. Well, Les, these are the types of guys that I think help your team, your whole locker room, get through the uh, dog days of summer, be it in the weight room or training camp field. Oh, yeah. I know He's got it. Go ahead, Les. Well, I was going to say uh, we do some consulting work with uh, Sam Walker, who authored – a book called The Captain Class. And he, and he basically studied these great teams and, and maybe uh, the captains of those teams and, and is really a, an expert in, in, in the, I call it the DNA that makes uh, specific types of captains. And uh, so after this pick and, and diving into it, and I think we all felt it, he definitely has categorized uh, Clay and he did it before the draft and it came to fruition. As, as a rare igniter, and igniter being that having that personality, having that infectious energy that doesn't matter, like you said, whether it's the dog days, the summer, uh, you can actually basically energize the locker room when everybody else wants to maybe, you know, you know turn around, go home, go take a nap. So uh, he definitely did it to Coach McVeigh there in the seventh round, and I think he did it to you know, our media on that phone call and maybe, uh, you know, our fans on social media. So 
Thanks, Taylor, for giving us a shot of adrenaline here. We appreciate the stories and insight on clay. Thanks, JB. All right. And as uh, Les already uh, documented, the last two picks of the draft, 248, 250, came via day three trade with the Texans. And the first of those picks became uh, their first kicker since Greg Zerline was taken in 2012, uh, which was the first draft of Les Snead's tenure with the Rams. So let's get some insight on the Miami of Ohio kicker, Sam Sloman, and we welcome in senior personnel executive, Brian Zanders. Now, Brian, is evaluating a kicker any different procedurally than the offensive and defensive positions you scout? Because it's been a, a while now, as we referenced, since the Rams have had to go to the college ranks for a place kicker. You know, it's, we still use the, uh, critical factors and position skills to evaluate the uh, – the big four things you want to look for on a kicker uh, is technique and fundamentals, power and explosion off the upswing, clutch production under pressure, and then personality and character, how, how, how are they mentally wired. Uh, but Sam Sloman's got an interesting story. He's, he followed actually a McVay path, Sean McVay path, from Roswell, Georgia, and attended Pace Academy in Atlanta and ended up at Miami, Ohio, uh, like Sean McVay. But uh, back to the evals, the technique and fundamentals, the one thing he showed was a consistent angle behind the ball approach, which is really good for a kicker. It makes it more of a, a straight angle on the field goal and extra points and more consistency. And then so he had that. And that's, that's like a first filter you filter on the – you know, you pass through on the eval. And then the second thing on the power and explosion – to kick long field goals, the last two years, he was 14 and 19 over 40 yards, which is really good uh, for college football. And he improved his kickoff length every season. So you're getting a high upside guy with the power and explosion there. And then the, that clutch production under pressure in the last two years in the second half or overtime, he was 27 out of 29, which is 93%, which is one of the best I've seen uh, in, in, in terms of college kicking. And then the last one, the personality and the character and, and the, his makeup, he's just a very uh, competitive guy. He's a tough teammate. He fits in well with the whole locker room. Um, he actually lives with the offensive lineman and wore number 79 and to fit in with his offensive lineman teammates. And, you know, he's known as a, a energy guy, a wrestler. He wrestles everybody, you know, so he's a real competitive guy and hopefully – you know, he's in that battle with our other two kickers. So we have three, a three-kicker battle. Hopefully, it'll be uh, fun to watch this fall. Les, do you want to give uh, Brian some grief for his witness protection setup here? I was going to say, he, he, he's doing that just in case uh, Sam Sloman doesn't work out. So uh, <laughs> no one will know who is in charge of uh, the, the kicking. But it is interesting, JB, you mentioned it, and, and as soon as – uh, we don't, you know, when you got somebody like Greg Zerline, you don't scout kickers every year. Uh, but when, when, when Greg moved on and we knew we were uh, looking for a replacement, we did put together kind of a separate uh, task force to help us, uh, you know, find, uh, you know, the, maybe a replacement for Greg. And, and, and that task force uh, searched the, the XFL and the AAF, and they got an XFL AFR alumni. Uh, they, we, we, they, they searched the CFL, and we got an alum from the CFL, and now we got an alum for, from the MAC. But uh, you got to love Big 79. That, that, he's got that, that baby Sebastian Janikowski feel to him. But, but, yes, X is in the witness protection program, just in case <laughs> it doesn't work out. Well, X, not to, not to bring you too much into the fray here, but back to the top of the draft just for a second to get your take on having a Florida State running back in the facility. Oh, it's, it's great. You know, like, like it's been documented, you know, they haven't had a lot of good draft picks the last couple of years, but he was clearly the, the best player on that team. And he came in, the, the more I researched him, uh, you know, I played there at Florida State and, and uh, I had to get, give a speech to a, like a booster group uh, last week. And I researched him. He was actually the number two prospect coming out of high school. And he had all these touchdown passes and touchdown runs in Mississippi, set records. And then he won the uh, Army Award for the best high school overall player. So he's got a lot of talent. He's got a lot of th you know, things to bring to our offense. The one thing that stood out on him, this goes to Jake Temme, one of our analytics directors that, that studied the running backs, is that he was 
the mo- uh, he was the best running back against the eight man front, which is when they load down the safety and there's eight defenders up front. He really uh, was the best one evading and making missing. We call it create on your own with football instincts. So it, it's all validated uh, on film with the data. Well, Brian, we've got some uh, nine and ten man fronts too, JB. <laughs> Did you really? I believe it. Uh, well, X, nice uh, to see your silhouette, I guess. And uh, we appreciate the tour of the palm trees in your yard and look forward to seeing you at Kalu soon. It's all good. Thank you. All right. You know, uh, JB Cam Akers was, was a quarterback turned running back. And the story on Sam Sloman, uh, back with my Atlanta ties, I'm very close to uh, the headmaster of Pace Academy. But uh, mm-hmm. he was a goalie on the soccer team. and and he got beat out because he was too short. Uh, so he was kind of a kid without a team. And at that point in time, Pace Academy, I call it, it's the, it's the, it's the high school that uh, Arthur Blank, the Atlanta Falcons owner, basically said, hey, we're going to get sports good here. So they were on their way to winning their first state championship. And the, the high school football team, they really liked the kid, you know, just because competitiveness and he's just a good friend to him. They talked him into, hey, why don't you come over uh, and see if you could kick because you played soccer I guess you can kick a football and he ended up being a a very clutch field goal kicker uh along their journey to that first state championship in football so a pretty neat story well hearing you hearing you and Brian talk about his attributes I mean I I like everything that I'm hearing I didn't necessarily hear like he's got the leg to boot it as soon as we cross midfield offensively like you might have had with Greg Zerline are you looking for maybe more consistency in, in standard field goal ranges as well as that clutch factor, not necessarily, you know, trying to match the distance that Greg the leg provided? Yes, I think going back to last year, we definitely want to uh, be more consistent in, in, let's call it the 40 to 49 range. That's, that's probably where you uh, get a cutting edge in this league, depending on how your season's going. It's a bonus when you can, uh, I, I'll call it, Cross midfield and maybe at the end of half, maybe at the end of the game, bang a fifty-plus yarder uh, to win it. And and Sam Sam was able to do that this year, probably five of seven on some fifty-plus yarders in in the fourth quarter. So that's definitely a bonus. But really, uh, our goal is probably let's call it not necessarily find the guy that's going to hit uh, the grand slams consistently, but definitely someone who's going to uh, hit those uh, doubles for us in that forty to forty-nine range. Makes sense. Last but not least, with the 250th overall pick, the Rams went with Tremaine Ankrum, an offensive lineman from Clemson, where he was part of two national championships. So to give us some background on the seventh rounder, we welcome in the director of college scouting, Brad Holmes. Brad, how are you tonight? Brad, how are you tonight? Doing good. How are you doing, JB? Excellent. So, hey, this is the only offensive lineman the Rams selected. How do you think he fits in with the deep, talented group already in place? Yeah, no, he's been a versatile guy that, you know, he um, he's played tackle and obviously we'll, we'll be projecting him inside to guard and maybe even center. But, you know, uh, what I always remember about Tremaine is that, like, the inside is when you go to a college, like the typical college visit for a scout is, you know, you usually meet with the pro liaison uh, or a coach in the morning before practice. And during that meeting, he will go over – that source will go over that player's background and their intangibles and all that stuff. So you have a better feel of the player before you do your on-field talent evaluation. And so uh, two days were five, two days prior before I went to Clemson, I was at Ohio State and University of Georgia. And looking at their offensive linemen, uh, they're all just huge, big offensive linemen, all 6'4", 6'5", 6'6". And again – We're talking about Clemson, Ohio State, Georgia. Those are the powerhouses of college football. So going into Clemson and hearing about Ankrum uh, and getting his background, which is very positive, I'm kind of expecting to see the same thing. And then I go out there on the practice field and I see him, and he's actually shorter, and he doesn't really look like what I thought I was going to see compared to those other bigger guys. But – Funny thing was that the guys behind him that were his backups were the big, tall, 6'5 guys that kind of looked apart. So kind of just took note of it and kind of just kept it moving. And so then we get into our December meetings, and we're looking at Terrell Ankrum, uh, Tremaine Ankrum as a group. 
And we're looking at him because Michael Pierce, who we're talking about Cam Makrums, who who does the Southeast for us, did a great job. He put a draftable grade on Tremaine Akram. So that's why we were watching him as a cross check in December. And as I'm watching the film, I'm like, wow, he actually does have good feet and he is tough and he is instinctive. And albeit he's short, like he's 6'2", but he has really long arms and he uses them very well in, in, in pass pro. And it was proven in those documents that he ended up being good. He was a senior bowl invite. You know, he was a combine invite. And, you know, he, he's, he's been a winner. He's, he's been to two national championships. So, you know, um, it kind of made sense going back. That's why he was the guy starting. And the guys that actually looked the part were the guys that were backing him up when I finally got a chance to watch the film. So um, one of the things that I always talk about is just uh, – I would say the, the the smoke clears towards the end of the process. And sometimes getting started in August in camp, you get all this information, but it's still a little foggy. But ultimately, with the great process that we have, it's like the smoke ends up clearing out. And that's what happened with Tremaine Ingram. And um, I would say even fast forward to the draft, um, I was having this conversation with Les, and Les was saying how uh, he had a conversation with Tremaine Ingram's agent. And his agent had a list of all these first round clients. And then you had Tremaine Ingram and, and Les was saying how his agent was saying how Tremaine Ingram was his favorite guy that he would chat with along the process. And again, going back to the smoke clearing, getting that background information on Ingram, they always harped on how mature he was, how smart he was, his great leadership, um, him being, a real alpha, how smart he was and all that good stuff. So, um, you know, just one of the – one probably one of the biggest quotes that uh, about Ankrum that sticks out to me is that one of the guys says that he was like 18 going on 28 when he first arrived here as a freshman. And uh, I, I just thought that that spoke volumes about his maturity and his intangible. So I think he's a guy that's going to project very well for us inside at guard and, and, and probably even center and – um, I think it will be a good addition for us. And, and he, he's a winner. You know, he's won college football championships, you know, in 17 and 19. And, um, you know, hopefully he'll be a good fit in L.A. and bring some more championship football. Beautiful rundown, Brad. Thank you Beautiful very much. Rundown, Brad. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you. See you. Good seeing you, JB. All right. Stay safe. All right, stay, stay, safe. Healthy. stay healthy. And Les, I think with those yeah, last couple of individuals we talked about, we see the value in that trade you made speaking with uh, Bryson earlier about collecting a couple extra sevens and allowing you to get a head start on the college free agent process that I know we're going to talk about next. No doubt. I, and the interesting thing I'll always remember about that pick is, as Brad said, he's 18 going on 28 when he got to Clemson. So it makes him about 32 now. <laughs> I remember calling him, and uh, obviously hindsight, I confused him because seventh rounder – when you're in the seventh round, other teams are calling these players uh, – you know, trying to recruit them to become maybe sign with them as college free agents after the draft. So nowhere along the way in this uh, conversation did I probably uh, let him know that we were drafting him. So I said, hey, are you excited to be a Ram? And, you know, there was not a lot of excitement there. And I'm like, okay, I guess everybody said he was no nonsense. I guess, you know what, getting drafted is just another, you know, another, you know, task to check on the, the day. But, uh, but come to find out through it all, and I remember Kara's definitely – that pick is going to help me improve now. Make sure I'm very clear when I call one of these young kids and let them know that we're drafting them with the 250th pick of the 2020 draft so that his – as he's in the bedroom talking to Coach McVay, he doesn't know whether he's getting recruited to be a CFA. And I think either sister, mom, or someone comes to his room and goes, hey – they just, they just showed your name on television. The Rams drafted you. So that's what I'll always remember about uh, Mr. Ankum. So cool. NFL draft pick. It's something you'll never be able to take off his resume. And perhaps it was meant to be because his father played hoops for George Raveling at USC. So a connection to Los Angeles as well. That is a great – I've, I've been wanting to connect with George Raveling. That's got to be one of the better sit-downs that you can ever be able to grab a chair and sit down with. So – Again, we've got a connection with Simbad now and Coach Raveling. A lot of training camp options. One of the many reasons I'm hoping against hope that uh, we get to be there in person and, and take part in some of those. 
Uh, of course, after all this work that we talked about is done on Saturday night, then uh, the real fun begins as the Rams signed 20 undrafted free agents and have added a couple more since then to round out their roster at 90 players. So back by popular demand for his encore, the director of scouting strategy, James Gladstone. And, you know, I wonder how our current predicament, James, impacted this process I just described relative to years prior. Did you notice a difference? You know what? In large part, I'd say this, dating back to this time last year, we became uh, uh, well-versed with the virtual capacity as it related to our, our draft preparation. We began uh, ultimately utilizing Microsoft Teams for uh, a large percentage of our, our meetings. And part of that reason being the fact that a lot of our scouting department is spread out across the country. So really that familiarity going into uh, this draft process uh, really gave us, in, in a way, uh, an upper hand and, and really allowed us to operate uh, efficiently and effectively and, and really take out of, of our minds what would be logistics and allowed us to focus on really the main thing. Now, this is a niche that you and the Rams have really been able to hang your hat on. In recent years, Corey Littleton, uh, a recent example of a college free agent turned starter and uh, now capitalizing in, in free agency. And the odds are another will come from this pool of players. So are there any notable signees from the Rams draft board in terms of these were guys we had draftable grades on and just didn't have enough picks to get it done in, in those three days, but we're glad they're in camp with us? Yeah, there's a number of guys across across the, the college free agent signing list that we feel like uh, are really going to challenge uh, for positions on the back end of our roster. And I think looking forward to the 2020 season and what position groups uh, our fans might look out for as it relates to the now 22 college free agents uh, who could potentially round out our roster, really start with wide receiver, working down to inside linebacker and, and interior defensive line. The backup quarterback position has potential to see some, some good competition uh, and even running back in a way. So I think one of the things that is ultimately important uh, to maybe highlight that is unlike rounds one through seven uh, of the draft, which are heavily broadcasted, heavily produced for viewership and fan consumption, the CFA process can be much more of an unknown. And, uh, and even though the fact is that just under half of all current 90 man rosters are made up of, of undrafted college free agents, you know, and obviously you brought up most notably, uh, Former Ram Corey Littleton signed a three-year, $36 million contract, making his way as a former college free agent into a starting role and, and now gets the payday. Current uh, CFAs that are on our roster include Malcolm Brown at running back, include Symbol Webster at receiver, uh, Troy Reeder at inside linebacker who played a ton of snaps for us last year, and Trez Patrick who uh, was an outside linebacker, played on four core special teams. But the way that we approach this college free agency process uh, mirrors what you might know to be college recruitment. And we pair a coach and a scout together at the beginning of April, and they form a committee uh, by position to begin evaluating a list of players that we, uh, we think could potentially fall out of the draft. And they begin recruiting those players by talking to agents and those players uh, specifically about what their role on the Rams roster could look like should they choose to sign with us uh, following the last pick in the draft. And to give you an example of what a pitch or an explanation might look like when talking to an agent and or a player using the wide receiver position as an example, uh, it would look something like this. As you go into the draft, looking at our current roster makeup, we had five wide receivers on our roster, which was the lowest number of wide receivers on any roster. So that means at the end of the draft, even if we select one wide receiver and we're at six on our roster, we are still the smallest number of wide receivers on a roster. That means that you have the best opportunity post-draft to find a place on our roster without ever having to step onto the field. Outside of that, you take a look at the past two draft processes and then college free agency with the willingness to in 2018 keep uh, 
to Daryl Hodge on our 53 man roster at wide receiver and carry seven wide receivers. So again, we would only have six if we select one in this draft. So that means that you have to challenge for what would be that seventh spot and go up against our, our fifth and sixth wide receiver who are prior college free agents. So along those same lines, I'm sure this fan base knows well what our preseason looks like and that we do not play our starters, giving our back end roster players a large uh, number of playtime and reps in the preseason, not only trying out for our roster, but also trying out for all 31 other teams should they get cut from ours. So that's, that's a little peek into what some of that dialogue looks like and hopefully provides some good insight to this fan base. Uh, it was an awesome look behind the curtain. And Les James mentioned the battle for backup quarterback. And I know everything is subject to change between now and week one, of course. But at this point, Jared's backup is going to be a college free agent, right? One way or another, if it's Josh Love or Bryce Perkins or, or even John Wolford, who came through a different channel there. Um, what can you say about how that position group is, is shaping up? We had Blake Bortles in the room last year. Well, I think the way it's shaping up, uh, uh, going back to last year, uh, Mr. Walford kind of earned our respect uh, in the preseason and, and actually beat out uh, a player, Brandon Allen, uh, for really a practice squad job for us because we had Bortles was going to be a locket too. But uh, John beat out Brandon, who went on to, to probably win a game in the NFL this year. So uh, that, was a, that was tough competition. But I think for all the fans who – who are out there who watch our preseason uh, to see John play last year. We don't game plan a lot. Uh, Sean's not going in to try to win the game. He's going in very vanilla. And there's, there's a, there's a nice approach to being vanilla in that. Yes, you don't give away maybe your trade secrets that you're going to present during the regular season, but it also is a good way to evaluate the players because they're not necessarily uh, schemed for success uh, like Sean and his staff so often does, but they actually have to go earn that success more in kind of man-to-man, one-on-one battle. So it's a good way to kind of, uh, let's call it, uh, figure out your talent. But John did a nice job of in that scenario of, of probably, I call it when the when the team, when, when somebody like Aaron Donald says, you know what, I'm going to stand up and, and, and kind of get closer to the field so I can see uh, Mr. Wofford kind of do his thing, run around and, and make plays. And I think that's a, a little bit what uh, Bryce Perkins did at Virginia along the way to, to their first ACC Coastal Championship. Uh, had the had the percentage of kind of like Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson in terms of 70-plus percent of their offense basically went through either their arm or legs. And, and Josh Love, if, if you're – if you're a fan of uh, Mountain West football, uh, you do know that San Jose State's well coached. They hadn't broken through yet in terms of uh, with this new staff, but if you follow San Jose State football, you know they're they're getting better and they're a tough out. And, and this young man uh, was very competitive. They, they even in the games they lost this year, it was close. So he's got some stuff to him. I like to say that for a backup quarterback, success often doesn't look like success. By that, I mean if they look like Ben Roethlisberger and they're a college free agent or late-round pick, you better run and run fast because they shouldn't be that, you know, that part of the draft. But uh, if they look a little bit like John Walver and Josh Love and, and Bryce Perkins and a little bit shorter or what have you, uh, but you know what, they've won a lot of games in college football. You know what, they may have what it takes to, to be here. And, and I'll, I'll leave it on this. Uh, college free agency, uh, always go back to this uh, – as, as James will tell you, that group that does the tiers, they really, they really want to land these college free agents, right? They, they recruited them. They're actually sometimes telling you, hey, don't draft them. I got them. They're coming with us, right? Fans can't say that. That's probably illegal. But you know what? It's all is fair in love and war, and we're going to keep doing it. But ultimately, I do know this. Uh, our longtime special teams coach, who's no longer with us, uh, Coach Fossil, because of, you know, I call it the – the competitiveness, he was recruiting Greg Zerline and Johnny Hecker to be college free agents. Uh, but a couple of kickers went off the board, and we were like, hey, Coach Fossil, we're not taking a chance. We're going to go ahead and draft this Greg Zerline guy in the sixth round. But uh, wanted to draft Johnny Hecker in the, in the seventh round. And, uh, but the competitive, hey, Coach Fossil, like, we can get him, we can get him. So 
let him let him win the day. Let the CFA committee win that down. Give him a little bit of love, and ended up drafting another player that we cut during OTAs in the seventh round. And I always say that we probably missed on an opportunity to to draft the player in the seventh round that will probably eventually end up in the Hall of Fame. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Johnny and Greg were uh, have been, and in, in, in Johnny's case, continue to be great for the organization. So good examples there. And James, we'll cut you loose for the rest of the night. But when I think back to last August, early September, and I saw how anxious the other 31 teams were to get, you know, waiver wire claims off of the Rams 2019 preseason group. That's a testament to a, a job well done. And I know this group will be the same. Undoubtedly, and I think that that all goes back to those CFA committees, the, the pairing of the scout and the coach who put in the energy and effort to ensure that we have great options uh, in our training camp. Uh, that's, that all goes back to those guys. And, and ultimately, we hope to see the same uh, results being harvested heading into uh, this next preseason and roster reduction. But talking back to what you just mentioned, we did uh, in 2019 see the most claimed players after the roster reduction uh, of any team last preseason. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if that trend continues, uh, but that's telling of what is a, a deep roster. You know what, JB? Uh, as we all know, I got to know Wade Phillips, one of the more wittier human beings in football, but I remember that day where we kind of broke a record or tied a record or for the most players claimed that cut down and in coach Wade style, he said, you know, we either got a really good team or we cut the wrong players. <laughs> As only Wade could put it. Well, uh, James, give the nerd nest my best. Next time you talk to them, another job well done by that group and uh, appreciate your insight. Let's stick around for a couple of fan questions. Will you, as we wind this down, we say good night. Sure they don't want James. Well, they do want James, but uh, there's a governor on the time limit we can, we can give him here. So these uh, final questions will be addressed to you, and then we'll, we'll close it out here on what's been another fun night. My privilege to hang out with you guys. Uh, Rob has the first question for you, Les. Can you discuss any players that you wanted badly in prior drafts that got picked before you were on the clock? And then ultimately, how did they turn out? Do you have any stories about procedures like that? Golly, the, the the answer is is definitely definitely yes, but uh, it'll probably uh, I'll go back to the, the the one that makes the Hall of Fame uh, rookie year uh, general manager. Uh, you know, we were we had multiple picks. I think uh, maybe three in the second round after after the Sam Bradford trade, and 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 in that 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 I know we got Janoris Jenkins in that in that hall in the second round but we made a trade back uh like we did in this year's fourth round uh to uh collect some more picks uh later in the draft and and one of the players we were definitely uh thinking of uh targeting there was uh Bobby Wagner hmm. and and that year Bobby uh didn't go to the combine so uh you know you m maybe thought he would slip a little bit farther uh in the draft but uh unfortunately he he didn't and he, and he didn't make and, and that's probably going to go down as the the one that uh you know let's call it got picked right in front of you that probably is hurt the most but considering he did go to a division rival and his probably say. to a hall of fame career with the Seahawks in your memory bank he has the advantage of playing you and tormenting you twice per year so that makes sense uh, Peter S. with our next question. Les, I have to know, where did you get your glasses? So this has been a theme of uh, the 2020 draft season. Give it to us one more time, Les. We, it's, uh, I call them, the, it's not a fashion statement. It's useful. Uh, I did used to have some pretty cool glasses, uh, at least in my mind. And, uh, and unfortunately, they were, uh, I guess I call it, they, they got a broken leg or what have you, whatever you call the side of these things that, that go down and, and, and were unwearable during the, uh, let's call it stay-at-home quarantine. And so my wife, Kara, has a lot of these glasses. I think they're called peepers or something. They come in bulk. Uh, I put them on, and I could actually read the screen. Obviously, I've, I've gotten closer to this screen, and I've been staring at the screen, and I need glasses to read what's on this screen. And if I don't have them on now, everything's blurry. So... That's the story of the glasses. The Amazon. good Amazon. The, on Amazon, look up peepers. I got about three pair uh, now over there in bulk. I will probably not go back 
to what I used to term as the, the cool, the cool glasses. So, uh, and so, and for the fan before who asked the Bobby Wagner, I always like to, to, I call it the Bobby Wagner rule. And, and there's a lot of ways you can, you can carve a draft strategy, right? It's, it could be this year, use a draft pick to, to uh, you know, let's call it, go get a Jalen Ramsey, a known commodity. It, it could be uh, 2016 and, and use a lot of picks to go what you think is going to be a QB uh, that's going to help lead you to a Super Bowl. And then there's even last year, there's an element of uh, do you actually take your first round pick or your pick and move back and get more draft capital. But the Bobby Wagner rule would be if a player falls to you and you really want that human being, don't get cute and don't worry about those extra draft picks. Just, just take that human being and, uh, and the rest will uh, take care of itself. Good Some of the best there. lessons in this business are learned the hard way. And thanks for sharing with us. And while Kara is there, you can tell her that uh, you now have the distinction of having the uh, most downloads and listens for the Ram Re Rams revealed podcast. So that's a little uh, resume bullet point internally in this neat household that you can roll with. I would not even be close to even getting to that record if, if Kara wasn't, if I wasn't married to Kara and she didn't <laughs> coach me. And there's oftentimes, again, that, that Tremaine Ancrum mess up, and it's going to help me as a GM so many years into this, you get better with your phone calls. But there were some Nick Saban moments where, you know, she was coaching me hard on, hey, that's a kid, you're changing his life. You, you can't be confusing. So uh, it, it's very good coaching, and she's definitely helped me with the, trying to be somewhat inter interesting on podcasts and such. Hey, what was the final answer to the M&M's question? And are there any left? You know what? I, I haven't eaten any. I did make a deal with the family. We had, we had five players that we thought uh, might get the 52 that we really wanted. Right. So uh, again, you can't just pick two players because when you're picking 52, that's, that would be probably bad business and bad strategy. But there was there was five in our in our A category, tier one category, whatever you want to call it, guys. We would pick first in the backyard if if we were playing football. And uh, and the deal was because I don't eat a lot of sugar, don't eat a lot of sweets. Uh, I would eat uh, maybe three M and M's, one blue, one yellow, one white. If we were able to land uh, two of those uh, players uh, with those two picks, and we were able to land two that were in those five. Uh, so uh, it was a good night, and I had to uh, eat a couple of, or at least three M&Ms. Can't wait to see uh, Cam and Van in uniform. Thank you, Les. Really do appreciate uh, the time that you give us answering these questions for our, you know, our season ticket members, uh, some of our most loyal fans in attendance tonight. We sure do hope to see you and them in person soon. Oh, definitely. Can't, can't wait to uh, be back in front of the fans and definitely can't wait to, uh, to hear their roar on Sundays in a, in a, in a, in a first class uh, venue and, and, and make this thing uh, a true home field advantage uh, from uh, 2020 on. And great to introduce so many of the uh, men and women who participate in the draft process in this edition of Behind the Draft. Thanks to all of our guests, uh, Lesney, James Gladstone, Michael Pierce, Billy Johnson, Vito Ganella, Ted Monago, Brian Hill, Taylor Morton, Brian Zanders, although we didn't get to see his face, just his palm trees, and Brad Holmes. I am JB Long saying good night. Stay safe, stay healthy, wherever you might be. Hope we get to gather at training camp and eventually at SoFi Stadium before too long. Have a great night, everyone.